So, uh, so I'm Paul Chvostek. I'm uh, currently working at a small company that um, creates software for training. We also say that we create uh, video games. It's um, a 20-person company that has um, uh, co-located servers and uh, an application, a set of applications that are written in Flash that communicate with those servers. And um, yeah, the business is completely dependent on its uh, on its web hosting infrastructure for um, for delivering its product. And um, so, in 2011, I started working there, and I started the long drawn out process of uh, converting the aging. Um, badly set up Linux infrastructure to something that would be a little bit more resilient and uh, uh, able to deal with a whole bunch of challenges that we identified. And um, the Linux servers had been sort of set up in a hurry, so they'd been, they, they weren't re really set up well. They were running Ubuntu. Um, they had, uh, uh, the, uh, at least they had been, the, the version that had been selected was a long-term support version, so that was kind of a plus. But um, the guy who had set them up, you know, he was a skilled software engineer, but he didn't really know very much about how to do systems. So he did the best he could given the, uh, given the tools at his disposal. But, um, but there were great opportunities for improvement and change. And so this is the story of that change. Yes? Was it 10 LTS? Was what 10 LTS? The Linux and stuff. 10.0.0.4, yes. Um, Something like crappy kangaroo, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can never keep them straight. So, in addition to uh, addressing management concerns about about the the known that that uh, that was already installed, replacing a known with an unknown, we um, um, we're going to talk about some of the um, opportunities that you should recognize in Linux environments that you may be dealing with or that you may come across. And basically, if you can improve reliability and uh, reduce risk and improve performance, that's even better job security than replacing a known with an unknown. Um, so, let's see. Is this thing going to work? So, okay, my first full time job uh, ever it was in 1990, working for a company that had SCO Xenix installed. Um, so, the. Uh, the, uh, th this is just sort of a little trip through history. Um, SCO Xenix ran Foxbase uh, applications, and uh, we had terminal servers that ran on, um, I think we had digiboards, and there was a 32-port multiplexer that allowed us to uh, have remote terminal servers in, a, in, in another office across the street via least line, and it was, it was fun at the time. You know, it was using new and interesting technology, but, um, but it was, it was very much of its time. Um, so I was there for a couple of years. I, I moved on to uh, uh, UUNet Canada, Canada's first commercial internet uh, provider. Um, and uh, the stuff running there was mostly SunOS 4. And then there was a bit of Solaris coming in at the time. Um, there were, uh, I think, some other things as well, but it was ancient history. I think we might have had a little bit of 386 BSD. Um, then, yeah, so Solaris 2 was, was part of that. And then, um, then I moved on to Canada's first public access dial-up provider, and we, uh, we were using BSDOS at that point. I'm not sure that's the right logo. I think it is. Is that? Yeah. OK, cool. Um, <clears throat> so we used BSDOS. We also used Linux. We uh, uh, had to um, you know, use a very old version of Linux. I think it was pre-version 1. So it was late 93 that Linux 1 came out, right? Yeah, so that would have been free 1. I remember the party that we had when we had 24 hours of contiguous uptime. That was, that was fun. And then we got a call during the party. <laughs> um, so then that company got sold to another company that uh, uh, was using, I think it was using NetBSD. But there was a mix of FreeBSD and NetBSD. Um, then I got a job at Sprint Canada running Solaris 2.5, which I think, I think was the last version that included a user UCB directory, where you had all of your uh, Berkeley tools. Um, so then after that, I was a consultant and went through uh, uh, FreeBSD version 2 through 5 through 4, and uh, 
then got a job at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation as a Linux and Unix administrator. And this was kind of fun because they were running Red Hat. And uh, uh, part of my job was to migrate them over to SUSE. Wait, what's it? Oh, no, they were running Red Hat and Slackware. And then we had to migrate over to SUSE. Can't keep track of this stuff. Um, because uh, CBC had a, an existing relationship with uh, Novell, which had to be respected. And um, I think they've since moved back to, uh, to Red Hat, given up on, on these uh, other Johnny come lately. Um, so, but CBC was also using Solaris uh, and uh, HPUX, and they even had a Vax. I couldn't find a Vax logo. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. So the um, um, interesting thing that I discovered in these uh, sort of early consulting days that I that uh, I hadn't really counted on was that was that I found that in general the more successful the company the uh, the easier it was for management to accept the idea of change and new ideas and I mean it seems kind of obvious when you look at it but when you're in it it's not always so obvious um, but more importantly. Um, um, Small successful companies seem to be the best at this. So if you're in one of those, that can be kind of lucky. And the biggest obstacles to, to change seems to be seem to be laziness and fear. And if you have confidence in your ability to adapt, then uh, then it cancels out the fear of change. So I discovered something else, which is that everyone is a child at heart. For one thing, people love to discover, and uh, they love new gadgets. They love making things. They love finding things that make them go ooh and ah, and um, they want explanations. It makes them happy. And uh, if they get answers to their questions, that also makes them happy. And if they don't, they won't be happy. So I always used to say when I was a consultant that um, I liked my customers rich and stupid. And in fact, we all know this, but the best customers are neither, well, no, they're rich, but they're not stupid. They're, they're people who have a very good idea of what business they're in um, and how to achieve their goals. And they're very organized. And they know to trust the advice of the experts that they hire because they know that they're hiring good experts. So um, interestingly, uh, these characteristics work for employers as well. And so as this for a segue, I started working at Experience Point a year and a half ago. I'm supposed to have a logo here. There we go. Um, and uh, Experience Point is one of these small companies that is a joy to work for. It is, uh, as I say, training businesses in certain things. We have, we have games, so it's a, it's a gaming um, atmosphere in the office. Um, with, a, with a name like Experience Point, you would kind of expect that. But um, so we have two products at Experience Point. One of them is this day long class teaching corporate change management. It's called Experience Change. And um, the other one is an in, a half day interactive seminar on innovation, which is called Design Thinker. And uh, Design Thinker is courtesy of a company in California called IDEO, who has come up with this uh, strategy for training innovation. I don't quite get Design Thinker, but I do get the idea of change management. And um, the interesting thing is that this is not change management um, ITIL style. It's completely different from anything that w you would deal with at a, an IT level. This is corporate change management. So this is changing the culture and dealing with psychology. and. Uh, um, like so many uh, uh, companies that try to establish themselves with other businesses, they've got a model. And the model is um, the seven-step model that, uh, that is developed from a couple of other models. The, um, um, let's see, the, the, the change model is, is used, would be used by a company that needs to migrate from an old way of doing business to a new way of doing business. And, you know, you would see something like this with Research in Motion or Kodak or pretty much any company that lasts long enough to outlive the environment that it grew up in is going to have to deal with change at some point. And um, so the, the thing is that all of these simulations are basically multiplayer games. They're written in Flash and they deal with the back end. And uh, there are people who, oh, this is, okay, so this is an example of LibreOffice. Um, animations at 4 a.m. Um, things flash, and then things move. I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, 
So anyway, actions get get implemented at the client on the client side in the Flash game. Um, Flash uses its own sort of magic protocol that talks to stuff running in PHP on our servers. And if any part of the equation goes down, if the servers are having a problem, if the internet is having a problem, we don't have a product, and we can't deliver. So that's kind of bad. When we can deliver, however, we get something that uh, on the facilitator side, so there's always a teacher in a class. There's somebody who is running the course. And the facilitator has a number of tools that let him do things like watch a horse race of the teams or the, or the participants in a game. So we can see as, as participants progress um, how they're doing. Because all of that stuff is stored on, in our servers. And so he just visits the portal. And presto, he's got access to this stuff. Um, if, the, uh, uh, if we want, we can review games after the fact and watch what kinds of decisions are made throughout the simulation. Um, and those decisions get uh, uh, mapped in, a, in this fuzzy tree that, um, that um, shows their effectiveness throughout the simulation. It's, it's, it, there's a little bit of magic to it, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And I think we have a great product, and it, um, and it works well most of the time. And, um, um, of course, you know it's when it doesn't work well that uh, that we have to come up with al with alternative ways of getting access to stuff. But back to the change model, the um, the change idea, this seven step model of change, is something that is based on work by uh, a few people. I mean, there are a lot of different people who have come up with models for how to deal with corporate change. One of the first ones was this guy named Kurt Lew. No, wait, Kurt Lewin was the second was the first one. Paul Cotter is a current one. So he's a, a former professor at Harvard Business School and has written a number of books on corporate change. Um, he's, um, he's an MIT graduate. Uh, he's a, he's a really well respected in the, in, in, the, in the leadership training and corporate change management field. And then the other guy is Kurt Lewin. And he's dead now. But um, ironically, he died the year that John Cotter was born. But in the early part of the century, he was um, um, working on behavioral psychology. And he, he taught and came up with, with theories. Uh, one of them was, um, was a three-step model. Um, yeah, These guys are sort of like the, the John Postel and Jordan Hubbard of the change management world, you know, not just because one of them is dead. But um, they're, they're sort of the the icons um, if, you're, if you're in that space. Anyway, so Cotter's model, uh, Lewin's model was a three-step model. And the idea was basically that when you're making a change, you want to unfreeze the environment that you're in. You want to make your change, and then you want to refreeze it. The idea was first you convince organizational stakeholders that change is necessary and, and good. Then you make the change. And then you make the new way your permanent way of doing business. Um, and it was nice and simple. And then you know, along came Cotter. And uh, he added a bunch of detail. So the detail sort of fits inside um, Lewin's model. And it makes sense. And then you know it gets expanded in courses. And so I won't expand that model here. But I will say that it was sort of what led to experience points model, which, um, which kind of combines and reorders some of the steps a little bit. So I can't tell you why one would be better than another, because I'm a sysadmin. I'm not a change training person. Um, but, uh, but apparently, our model is well enough liked that it's taught alongside the Cotter model and you know, with the Lewin model kept as a, as a reference. And uh, it's taught in multi-million dollar companies and in, uh, in respected business schools. So um, I think we must be doing something right. Um, OK, so enough of the introduction. Let's get interactive. Let's do some shows of hands. Um, OK, thanks. Um, so OK, who here is solely or ultimately responsible for the architectural decisions in the places that you work? OK, so hands down, everybody who owns the company. Okay. <laughs> OK, so everybody who remains, you must be pretty lucky to be working in, a, in an environment in which you're so well trusted. That's rare. And you, know, you have to. Uh, if you're not one of the people with, who just had hands up, you're, you're dealing with struggles all the time. Um, so next, uh, next question. Who here is really a Linux sysadmin in disguise? 
<laughs> yeah, that's always the case. So yeah, you're you're yeah exactly. <laughs> um, lots of people have managers who you know sp read spammy mailing lists about the cloud and uh, don't know anything about <laughs> don't know anything about BSD because it's never mentioned in those publications. So that was my life at CBC and was the primary reason that I left the CBC. And uh, every day that goes by, you'll hate yourself a little more. It's time to change your employer. So that doesn't mean leave your employer. That means change your employer. Um, every machine that uh, you have deployed has a number of components. And those components, um, those components will eventually die. And the, uh, where am I here? The mean time between failure is sort of a, a term that's thrown around quite a bit. And all of these components are, you know, they're going to have an eventual life. And uh, they're going to die eventually. And you might come up with calculations where you can estimate the length of the, the, the lifespan of a server. You know, pick the shortest MTBF. And that's, uh, that's uh, possibly when a server could go. But really, you know, that's, that's just a bunch of bull. Because, um, this is just not how things work. Components will fail at any time. And the MTBF is made up of averages. And, um, or the MTBF is an average. And an individual component isn't going to fit that average. You can't predict when a, when a drive is going to fail. Uh, you can't predict when a fan is going to stop spinning. Spinning things stop. Capacitors blow. And that's just life. So you will get a call in the middle of the night. And, uh, or you know, when you're on vacation and or when a salesperson has an important presentation that they're doing, and that's, that's just how it works. So the way Google would fix this is not how we would necessarily always fix this. Um, you have to deal with smaller budgets in, in a smaller company. And um, you have to deal with people who probably don't even know about IT asset, man asset management or hardware life cycle, and maybe haven't even assigned an annual IT budget. or or a plan for, uh, for upgrading things. So um, what you need is an upgrade path. And uh, path needs an endpoint. So before we, before we figure out what we're going to do, we should think about where we want to be. So let's look at your simple single server environment. So that's, that's um, bad for a lot of reasons. Um, we need to build some redundancy into this. We need multiple parts. So, so let's say, say we have two web servers. OK, so that's fine and dandy. But um, we, don't have, uh, we don't have everything we need at this point, because um, two web servers are going to need uh, their databases synchronized. So OK, let's add replication. Let's, um, let's also add maybe uh, a load balancer in front, because you can't just change your DNS to have uh, uh, to, to have your websites hosted on a different server. And well, OK, so now you've got another single point of failure. What are you going to do about that? Well, let's make two load balancers. And so you get the idea here, two of everything, um, two internet connections. And well, OK, so maybe a second router behind that one. Um, <laughs> and if you're, if you're really worried about trucks going into your building uh, in, uh, or truck bombs blowing up your colo, then any cast. And that's completely out of scope because um, I can't really diagram that. It takes too long. Um, so once we've got uh, once we've got sort of a, an ideal, it's something that we can sort of express to management and say, hey, you know, we need um, we need to fix things, and here's a here's a plan. Here's a way that we can do it. Um, when I started at Experience Point, we had a very simple network diagram. Um, at first, this doesn't look too bad. We've got two web servers. We've got two database servers. There's something that might possibly be replication. Um, you may not be able to uh, make all the changes you want because of budget constraints or limited risk perception, but you know we can start. And so here's what I was starting with. Um, there's a. Uh, there's a bit wrong. There's a bit that's wrong with this. So we've got an internet connection, we've got a load balancer, and we've got the various servers. 
what we don't have, oh, actually, okay, let's ask a question. <laughs> I didn't memorize my slides, nope. So, okay. <laughs> if load isn't an issue, what's the absolute minimum number of nodes that you need for redundancy? Anyone, shout something out, shout a number. 200. That's a good number. Um, I would say that the number is two. And the reason for that is that redundancy is the ability for things to be emitted without loss of function, at least in this environment. OK, so we've got two as a minimum. Um, that's not always what we're going to want to do. Uh, in this case, how do we get here? Damn it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think I, maybe it's the mouse. That's it. OK, uh, I guess we'll go back to the experience point change model. <laughs> so let's make our first step trying to understand the situation that we've got. What have we got? Oh, understand. Yes, that's what we're doing. So we've got a, uh, we've got an, uh, a small network here. But if we start filling in the details, it starts to look really horrifying. For example, this router is CyberGuard. I don't know if you know CyberGuard. It's a little embedded Linux box. It's basically like, like uh, a Linksys running tomato without much of the functionality. Um, it kind of works, but it's really not designed for that kind of environment. You know, you might use it for your, off, your home office or even a real office as long as you had a second one or a plan to upgrade really soon. Um, second thing here is that this is not a data, this is not replication. This is DRBD, which is, for anyone who doesn't know, it's basically hashed for Linux. Um, this guarantees Database corruption. You, you're, not, you're not replicating the database. You're not making a copy of things. What you're doing is you're ensuring that your failover process will give you a broken database. Um, you know, it's like a file system. If, if, uh, if it goes down dirty, it comes up dirty. And, and when it's dirty, things are broken. Blocks don't get copied. And probably the blocks that didn't get copied were the things that were to the table that is being written to most frequently. And that's the one that's most important, because that's what you're writing to most frequently. And um, it's just not good. So the next thing here is we add the applications. And so you might think, oh, well, somebody setting this up would, put, uh, would make CyberGuard uh, a, proc a reverse proxy, make it a load balancer. Well, no. Instead, what we had was um, different applications on different web servers. And just in case Design Thinker went down, we added Design Thinker hosting ability to the backup SQL server. Awesome. Come on, do show a pen because you haven't been in one point in the No, I think that would just be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> we can sneer, but we've all done it. Yeah, well. So, um, to be fair, this stuff was set up by a software developer who didn't really have a background with this kind of thing. Oh, don't take pictures of it. That's just silly. <laughs> um, he set things up in a way that, that, you know, it did make sense to him. And it was a small company, and he was, the, he was the most senior technical person. And so it worked, and it was good enough. And, uh, and people were happy. And then I started working there, and people became less happy. <laughs> so let's go back to the change model again. <laughs> So the next step in the change model is enlist. So remember that we're still on the planning phase here. Left-hand side is plan at the management level. Right-hand side is implement across the company. Enlist is basically pulling in people who are going to help the actual planning process. In a really small company, there doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a huge change team. You don't need to enlist a lot of people. You're the only one doing anything anyway. All you need, basically, is to get, get your boss to approve things. Um, and you know, in a, even in a larger company, you may be lucky. You may actually have responsibility and um, the, uh, the ability to, to take action. Um, doesn't always happen, at, happen in the same people. Um, yeah, last night over beer, I was hearing people talk about sneaking FreeBSD into their environments. And I think lots of us have done that as well. And you really want to avoid being sneaky if you can, because well, it's great to get FreeBSD in your work environment. The last thing that you want is for the people who make decisions to associate FreeBSD with something that undermines their authority. That's the best way to make sure that you won't continue to be able 
to run FreeBSD, and that that environment won't run it after they kick you out. Um, so, okay, after enlist, we get envisage. Develop a vision and strategy. So in this change model, um, if you've already convinced higher up folks that things need to happen, then, then you're probably the only one coming up with, with a vision for how to make those changes anyway. Um, and of course, you know, if you're a small enough team, the solutions are obvious whether or not they're correct. So when I started at Experience Point, this was something that I put up in the corner of the whiteboard within the first couple of weeks of starting there. Does it look familiar to anyone? <laughs> yes, well, yeah, that's true. You were there. Um, so I didn't know everything that was wrong with the environment there, but I did know that I needed something that would start turning people towards the idea of change. Now, interestingly, I didn't know anything about the change model. I had no idea what this company that I was now working for actually did. I, you know, still lots of stuff is fuzzy, but, but at least you know, I knew that a server environment needed redundancy and we had none, and this was something that I could use to leverage change that would make them more dependent on me, which is always good for job security. Um, but we needed to get a process started, and so we needed a target. Here was the target. And it's a simple drawing, and it was supplemented with a lot of hand-waving and excited conversations and uh, got people enthusiastic. And, um, and I left the drawing on the corner of the whiteboard probably for three months. And there were, there were always people going by saying, oh, what is that? That's interesting. Salespeople, um, you know, support people would, would just not understand this new bizarre thing that the new guy had put up. Um, and so you know, there was lots of opportunity to sell the concept of moving towards something that would be better. Um, so remember the uh, number of machines needed for redundancy. I picked three for web servers because I wanted to make sure that even if we had to take a server out for, uh, for upgrades or surgery or whatever, that we would still have redundancy. So, Web servers are the things that you change most frequently. You know, a router, or a, if you're doing a BSD router, or a load balancer, or a database server, packages don't change all that much. But when you're an active software development company, um, and, P and you're running PHP, which you know, changes every two weeks, and you want to keep things up to date, and you want to add new, new packages, new, uh, new PHP extensions, um, you know, that's something where, where there's, there's greater opportunity for a breakage. So, uh, so yeah, everything else tended to be just um, just uh, a, a single spare. For the load balancers, I mean, okay, so you could you could spread traffic over two load balancers on the front end, have both of them picking up traffic, I think. But it was easier in this environment just to say, okay, we'll use CARP. We'll have a load balancer. We'll have a spare load balancer, and put CARP on the front end. So. So these are VLANs, actually. There's just one switch. We don't have separate physical. Uh, they, we, we, I didn't want to push for separate physical sw switch infrastructure. Um, setting up OSPF on every host was going to be more than I wanted to deal with. Well, you also get into the point where you have a huge complexity. Here. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You want you want your goals to be achievable. So you know. Good. Yeah. So. Um, So yeah, if one if one hard drive fails, you know it may be an outlier in the MTBF calculation, but we've got we've got spares here. I at the time I looked at the idea of having NFS servers to to share back end, but it turned out not really to be necessary. When we do a deploy, we are sync a copy of uh, of uh, uh, of our software and change a sim link, and we can copy all of the software and then we can change the sim links all at once. So. Um, the web servers are acting as their own file storage, and then we've got databases. So the, the compromises here were yeah, to achieve quicker wins and so that things would, uh, would remain doable. Um, back to the change model. So once we're out of the plan and we've got a basic idea, remember all that planning is management, so that's all high level. It's none of the specifics. We're not coming up with you know, we're going to upgrade this server to that, or we're going to take this out on that date and replace the hardware with this specification, because that's not what management cares about. They want the pretty pictures in the corner of the whiteboard, but they, they want the pretty pictures and they want to be able to make a high-level decision that you will implement. You'll do all the heavy lifting. 
Um, so before you actually get to the heavy lifting, which is act, step six, we have to, in the change model, which is, of course, designed for larger companies, l lighting a fire is kind of important. You've got to get people on board with, with the changes that are about to happen. If management has decided that stuff is going to happen, you've still got the rest of the employees in a large company that, that need to participate in this process or are going to have things forced down their throats. So if they're on board, it becomes a little bit easier. Um, lighting a fire is terminology that I was never really incredibly comfortable, comfortable with because our colo is at Pier 1 in Toronto. Yeah, well, despite fires. Of the fire at Pier oh, 1? Yeah. OK. We could have put it in. Yeah, oh well. That's amazing. Well, so they did a good job despite the fire. But OK, in the change model, the motivate, the motivate phase um, yeah, really, really doesn't apply so much. Because sharing concerns, OK, you know, you're doing that with a, with a small group. Uh, set ambitious stretch targets. Who knows what a stretch target is? Three people. OK. So, so a stretch target is, is a target you don't plan to reach. It's something that um, is out there, is sort of a dream that you're coming up with, that, uh, that is designed not to work towards, but to make you think about other ways of achieving problems, or uh, other ways of achieving solutions, not achieving problems. Um, <laughs> you'll do that anyway. Um, so, so uh, for example, in our case, we, uh, we recognize that, um, that by using a server cluster, we would need session stickiness. And so you know, we, had a, we had a few uh, ways that we could deal with that. The obvious one would be just turn on st session stickiness on the load balancer, which is actually what we did. But in trying to come up with alternate solutions, we actually learned a little bit more about what the capabilities were. Like, for example, the fact that we could potentially use memcache servers to share uh, PHP session information between the, 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 the web servers. That's something we might do in the future. It wasn't in scope for this, but it's a, it's a neat idea and it sort of gives us the possibility for new change projects that will come after this one. So it's still a value, valuable thing to do. Identifying a crisis. This is kind of where the fire comes in. Um, I have a crisis story. So I had been working there for three months. One of the first things I had done, because the, the software developer, the PHP software developer who was the guy before, um, whenever, whenever they would deploy software, he would basically check stuff out of SVN, um, do whatever was necessary with, with the Symfony framework to make uh, a directory that he would then FTP over to the server, and then change the permissions on the appropriate directories manually for logs and cache and stuff like that. And so it was like a four hour process to deploy a new piece of software. That was just the standard way of doing things. So one of the things that I did very early on was write a script for that. Um, and, uh, and well, uh, rsync. I mean, <laughs> ooh. So unfortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, there was a bit more to it. I mean, Symf Symphony, the framework, does need a little bit of stuff to be done. And instead of doing it manually, you can have the framework itself take care of things like permissions and stuff like that. Wahoo. Um, but, uh, but if you make an error in your script, and then you go on Christmas vacation and give somebody else the ability to run the script, that can be a recipe for disaster. And it was, because while I was in the plane over the Atlantic Ocean, um, um, somebody typed something that caused the script to break in such a way that it did a chmod-capital R www data slash. So that was, that was fun. Nothing stopped working directly, except that we couldn't SSH in because the keys were changed. Um, Apache was still running. All the processes that were running as root still had access to everything they needed. But we couldn't SSH in because all the keys were, were cha had changed ownership. Um, and, uh, and we couldn't deploy software. Luckily, we didn't need to deploy software. Everybody went on vacation and said, OK, hands off. We're just going to let Paul come back and deal with this. And, and that's what happened. Two weeks later, I came back, rebooted, and, and uh, I actually had to reboot off a CD because I couldn't <laughs> reboot in single user mode. <laughs> um, password file wasn't owned by root anymore. Um, 
and uh, devices had changed. This was old Ubuntu. Um, it, uh, it, it was fun, but what it really did was it identified the need for a backup server. It identified really in, in, a, in a very scary but not critical way, not like financially damaging way, that this is, this is an area that really needs attention. And so, so it, it really did a good job of, of, uh, of uh, helping the change move forward. So um, let's see. One of the other things that, I, that got put onto the whiteboard was a list of applications running on various servers. And so this is sort of the, the uh, I think the, um, the other model, or the, the diagram was up to the right of this. But so different servers were listed here, and, and, uh, and then the applications under them. But the most important thing here was that we started identifying some risks. And uh, remember, we're in the motivate stage. We need to light a fire, and so you identify the risks and then get people scared and they, if they aren't already scared enough. Um, so this was by far not a comprehensive list. It was, this was an introduction on the whiteboard that got erased uh, a little while later after this got committed to, to some other document. But um, yeah, Cold Fusion, huh? <laughs> that server is still running, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the more comprehensive version of this list uh, was implemented as a risk register. So this is a project management term that um, sometimes gets called an operational risk log. And so, so I started this with, uh, with the following fields. And basically, you come up with the list of things that could go wrong, and you come up with ways that you can fix them. Um, and at a very high level, it's, it's sort of a, an unprioritized to-do list. Um, so once you add a few more fields, then it starts getting some, pri some uh, priority. You add probability and impact. And you can you know, pick, say, 1 to 3 or 1 to 10 for each of those. And then priority is simply the product of the, of the other, two, other two fields. So you know what order to put things in, because you know that something that is high probability but low impact um, really isn't isn't that much of a much of a concern? If something has, if something is not going to happen, zero probability, then it doesn't need to be a priority at all. And then owner and ETA turns it into a bit more of a plan, a planning tool. Um, so and yeah, probability is always a guess. Impact is always a guess. But you're the expert, so your guess is probably pretty good. Um, and uh, you want to have conversations with people as well because because you want to find out. How, what, that, what the impact is going to have on different people in the business. So like if X were to disappear at 9 PM on a Friday before a long weekend, would this really be a problem? If it were to happen at 9 AM on a Tuesday, would it really be a problem? Um, and then this gets implemented in, well, for us, Google Docs. We use, uh, we're a big Google Doc fan at Experience Point. And it makes updates really easy to share. So uh, rather than sending around physical spreadsheets, we, we really like the idea of, of shared documents. Um, yeah, and some of them were kind of, kind of interesting. The SQL hardware failure, uh, post changes delayed, server configurations not, not stored in SVN. So now they're stored, well, they're stored in RCS sometimes. Still working on that. Back to the change model. So. Speaking of sharing documents, we're kind of talking about communication. Um, and the idea here is that uh, we're in envisage. So the envisage phase, phase is, is where we're trying to figure out more of what we actually want to do. Um, and we're trying to, uh, trying, to, trying to communicate this. No, we're not in envisage. We're trying to communicate. <laughs> uh, um, the stuff that was in Visage is what we're communicating. The input that we ask for is, is what turns into actions in the next step. We want to involve people. We want to, uh, uh, we want to do as much as we can to make everybody an owner of the change that's going to happen. Um, and you know, a lot of the model in a small company, like I said, is going to get mashed together. And uh, if you have open-minded people around, it's it turns out not to be much of a challenge to get things going. But then, so we move on to the, uh, on to the last bit. Um, 
if you uh, if you make all of your priorities and projects and progress visible, that's going to that's going to reduce a lot of resistance. Um, in the act phase, this is what I was saying before. You haven't come up with the plan before this, the specific plan, what you're going to upgrade, what you're going to uh, uh, what you're going to be replacing. You've come up with the high level version of it, but not the specifics. Um, so in in our in our transition, I couldn't just cannibalize existing servers, right? Because we had to deliver product while stuff was going on. I couldn't take down our existing web. Oh, I should mention that the two web servers were I don't remember the model numbers, but like Dell seventeen oh something or other with no IPMI, no out of band management. Um, the SQL servers were a model up that had a, a, a baseboard management controller that if I queried it, would crash the server. So um, yeah, the, all of that hardware basically needed to be replaced. So I gave our good friends at IX Systems a call and ordered a stack of servers. Yay. I'm going to be ordering some more soon, too. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you'll give me a better price. Um, so, um, so yeah, basically had to, had to replace this, these huge honking things with very small, lightweight, uh, uh, expertly built and wonderfully supported machines. Yay. Um, so we use, at Experience Point, we use Basecamp for a lot of project management. And so to-do lists are easily communicated using that as well. You know, anything that you can use to make it easier to communicate is going gonna, is gonna to streamline stuff. Um, um, Basecamp isn't the most flexible tool. It's, it sucks in a lot of ways. But one thing that's really good is that any time I put anything into it, the next morning, my boss gets an email that lists what got done. So the more I, can, the more I document in one-liners, you know, I don't have to be exhaustive because the tool doesn't let me be exhaustive. But the more I document in one-liners, the better understanding um, my boss has of what changes are actually happening and what progress there is on, on, on the change project. So, um, so yeah, you really want to be bragging whenever you're implementing new systems. If you're, uh, uh, if, if you're not communicating, then you're not doing anything. So um, let's see, where are we? The, uh, the change that we implemented was sort of this. We're not 100% through the change. Um, the SQL servers uh, aren't yet migrated out of Ubuntu. And so we still have that broken DRBD between them. But, um, but I'm not relying on the second SQL server. I'm doing a, uh, an SQL dump every four hours and backing that up on a different machine. So. If it dies, it dies. And if it doesn't come up clean, OK, so we restore from a backup. Um, the two load balancers are using CARP. Don't use UCARP. It's a completely different beast. Do, do we know the difference between CARP and UCARP here? OK, so CARP shares an ARP address, a fake ARP address, between two NICs. UCARP ties an IP address to one NIC or another. So CARP relies on the servers um, informing the switch, the, your Ethernet switch, of the new location of, uh, of a MAC address, whereas UCARP relies on the uh, MAC address table to update the IP address onto a new MAC. So in one case, uh, you're, in one case you're relying on the switch, and on the, in the other case, you're relying on everybody's, host, everybody's uh, uh, MAC address table, everybody's ARP cache. Um, you, yeah, yeah, and it may be slower to update, and you can't control it all in one place. So better to use CARP. So, um, so we've, got, we've got the two load balancers. Each of them is an HTTP reverse proxy. Um, they're running pound. Um, they they uh, can source independent requests to the, to the web servers. And in fact, this isn't quite complete because the database servers also need to get updates from time to time because we're not hosting a package cache locally. So there's a second network here that lets them get to uh, forward proxies as well. It's easy, just a tiny proxy for outbound access. You don't, need a, you don't need very heavy stuff just to get systems talking to the outside world. Um, and then, of course, uh, um, because the web servers are jails on app servers, we can run multiple ones. So we're working on upgrading our own software to Symphony 2. 
and instead of Symphony 1, which is obsolete and outdated and should be tossed. Uh, Symphony 2 can run in PHP, PHP 5.4. Symphony 1 can't because it's using things that were dropped in, five, in PHP 5.4. So, so we have a new set of web servers, and, and any time we have something that is appreciably different from our existing hosting infrastructure, if we needed to run something that used, uh, I don't know, Perl CGIs, I'd set up new web servers for that because I don't want to touch things that are running our production infrastructure. It's easy to manage more servers, right? It, more virtual servers. It's, it's more work, but once you're past a certain point, you're going to have to automate, your thing, uh, automate things anyway. And so might as well have more. And then, and then reduce the risk of, uh, of, of breaking things as you, as you make changes. So um, back to the change model. The last phase is consolidation. So remember the Lewin model where we refreeze? This is kind of the refreeze. This is, uh, this is where we, uh, we use our credibility to suggest changes to new system. Rem remember the, uh, the stuff we we're, were coming up with before, the, um, the, the, the stretch targets? Well, OK, so maybe some of them will become new changes that we're going to do. Or we've learned other things that we need to do, or stuff that we didn't want the scope to creep into now gets, now gets addressed. Um, but we've now set up systems that are going to be stable and aren't going to change. Um, and if you're in an environment that has more people, you know, bring them in so that, so that you, can be, uh, you can be a little less stressed when you go on vacation. The, um, you know, the, I have friends who are capable Linux administrators. Uh, I mean, OK, friends. Um, <laughs> OK. <laughs> some of them, some of them even, even make it work fairly well. Uh, but you know, every one of the problems that we were dealing with at Experience Point could have been solved using Linux as well. Be, I mean, well, except for maybe the, U, the CARP versus UCARP thing, because I don't think CARP is implemented. You're shaking your head. But it's not. They're actually different. One of, them, one of them is moving the MAC address around, and the other one is simply binding the IP to a different MAC. Different interface. Hmm. Maybe I need to do more reading on this. <laughs> okay, then I'll I'll do some some rereading on that because that was my understanding and. And uh, uh, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, so okay, that that anything that you want to do in FreeBSD, you could you could you could do in Linux. So the idea here is that you're implementing changes, and then using your expertise in something that you like better. You know, it's it's it is when it comes down to it, a, a religious or a preference decision. Um, all of the other stuff that we're doing here is handled by third-party software. It's the same software that you're running, whether it's PHP or Postgres or MySQL or, or Apache or Nginx. All of them are basically the same software you're running in whatever, in whatever OS. Yeah, we. <laughs> so. so if you can express your preference well enough, others will share it. And uh, that about wraps things up for me. Um, anyone have other comments or questions? Cool. Oh, and uh, for Mike, I added a picture of my cat. Uh, it's too dark. Anyway, end. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Brody. When Brody wants to see. Uh, when you went to whomever for the, they're like, oh, we're going to change this <laughs> and go to VC, did you get blame on that? Or did they be like, yo, whatever, it's really cool, Linux, we will. In, in my environment, I was pretty lucky in that, in that the guy who was um, allowing me to make changes, the previous senior technical person, was the software developer. And he said, I freely admit that I don't know this stuff. And so if you think it's better, Go ahead, yeah. and uh, and so yeah, I, I didn't have to struggle with that so much, 
Interestingly, a lot of the stuff that we sort of take for granted maps onto the change model, which is kind of interesting. Um, but um, um, you know, the the, uh, the the stuff that we naturally do sometimes is is uh, a, a, is a little bit sort of against what we should. Like you know, the idea of doing things um, surreptitiously. If you install FreeBSD everywhere, you know, and your boss doesn't want it, then you could you could be snookering yourself. I know in the government. <laughs> and, and that apparently is the way to get things done. Well, there's also a lot of organizations where it's like nobody cares. Yeah. Well, that was one of the cases. And in your case, that was what happened. They put in Linux because they didn't. They knew Windows probably wasn't the best yeah. solution. But I mean, there's no reason you couldn't do what you did on, on Mac or, or Windows or Cisco. Or the pl the playing dumb idea is 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 a trick. I mean, we did that at CBC as well. We we would set up something that was using FreeBSD, and then we would rely on it and say, oh well, you know what? That got set up a while ago. Um, we can't really change it now. We'd need a big project to do that. But you know, we can look at that in the future, but it's not really a high priority right now. Let's just leave it as is. Well, and you face the same change the other direction. Well, why is it this? Well, because it is this. Well, why would we change it? Mm -hmm. Why do we keep it like that? So it's black and blue. OK. Uh, how, well, one of the things that uh, you run into is a you know, project that you've ran on for a while. It's kind of hard to. Yeah. How long do you keep loaded? Um, each of the components here got implemented as its own project, its own sort of sub project. So everything has to get divided into you know chewable chunks. Um, if if a project is too big, then it's it's never going to be finished. So you say, okay, well that's not the project, but this is the project, and then that's the next project. So Replacing the database servers is the next project. Replacing the replacing the web servers was a pro, was like replacing one of the web servers was the very first project where we did a proof of concept, made sure that this new stuff that nobody had used before um, would actually work with our software. And then once that was in place, you know, the the order was basically one web server, one load balancer, a second web server, a third web server, a second load balancer. And now we're up to the uh, now we're up to the databases. Well, that would have been another risk. So you know, if you identify a risk, if you say no, you know what, your decision there kind of really caused us to do something nasty to the pooch. Um, we were, were in a worse situation than we were when we started. We either need to back out or we need to go forward. But right here is not comfortable. Um, you know, Maybe it turns into a new project, but at, at least you've got more incentive for change at that point. Yeah, train your coworkers. Uh, <laughs> um, the thing is, Linux people are available very easily. FreeBSD people are still available pretty easily if you advertise for them, because a lot of the people answering Linux ads are FreeBSD people. <laughs> the better ones are. <laughs> You know, you'll get a much better Linux sysadmin if he is comfortable with FreeBSD. Well, even even OpenBSD, or maybe even Net. I'm not sure about that one though. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not that you know what you're doing, but that's kind of the thing that you would get into that question to help the lab. Yeah, yeah. And if if you need to come up with uh, with benchmarks, you know, if performance is an issue, licensing. you can, well, yeah. No, licensing tends to be less of an issue because a company is probably just using commodities, right? They don't really care what the licensing is. 
if, if it's downloadable and installable and they don't have to pay for it, it doesn't really matter beyond that. But the um, um, what, being able to buy support, if you're on vacation, what happens? Yeah, the bus factor, that's, that's vitally important. Um, but if you're the only person in a company, whether or not it's FreeBSD or Linux, you have a bus factor of one. Yeah, the right tool. The right tool for the job is a great way of of, uh, of getting FreeBSD into things. You know, if if both of them will work, then and 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 you have a greater comfort level. Yeah, if you have to pick one and you're going to be managing it, then they should probably pick the one that you're picking because you're going to be managing it. Um, and if they don't like your opinion, then why are they asking for it? Well, I don't know. If if they don't like your opinion. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's the company that you want to change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brody. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever experienced the resistance to go to BSD because they know you're a BSD guy. OK, so remember slide two? That was that long list of operating systems. I'm also a Solaris guy. I'm, I mean, I, I'm an <laughs> HPUX guy, if you really stretch. Yeah. Um, I can run SAM, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but I mean, it, w when it comes down to it, what you have is, is a wealth of knowledge on a number of different operating systems. And of the ones that you've been dealing with, you know, Linux has risen to the top because, out of necessity uh, because a lot of people are running it. And then FreeBSD has also risen to the top because of excellence, or NetBSD, or OpenBSD even. Um, but you know, it, one, once you have your preference, the idea is you want to be able to, to explain why, it, why it's better. And sometimes why it's better is simply because you can do things with it more quickly than you can with Linux. ZFS, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Okay. So that's it. Thank you.